All right, we're going to go ahead and get started this evening. So welcome. Uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us tonight to discuss some back to school issues related to uh, special education rights. My name is Mike Connolly. Uh, I am uh, the supervising partner here at McAndrews for the special education uh, department. Um, I, uh, in addition to supervising the department, I also represent families uh, throughout the, the state of, of Pennsylvania in a variety of, of education matters, many of which we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this evening. And I, I will let my co-presenter uh, introduce herself. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Heather Hulse. Um, I'm a senior partner uh, and I, I manage our Scranton office as well as our Western PA office. Right. Thank you, Heather. So as we go through tonight, um, if you do have uh, have questions, the chat feature is enabled um, so you can go into the, the, the chat uh, and ask a, a question. Just make sure it's, it's coming to everybody so that we, you're sure that we see it. Um, and we will, uh, as we can, we will try and answer uh, most of most of those questions if we're able to. Um, if not, due to time constraints or the number of questions, um, you can always uh, reach back out to us uh, to our office, and we'll we'll do our best to get any questions for you that weren't answered answered. So, uh, again, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to be discussing uh, some special education issues, primarily in the context of the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, but there might be opportunities throughout the evening where we may also touch on uh, some similarities or differences as it might relate to Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which also uh, addresses needs of, of students in the school setting with uh, students with disabilities. So with that, we'll go ahead and, and get started. So you know, what, when we're talking about special education, what are we really talking about? We're talking about the provision of a FAPE, a free and appropriate public education. Um, it is, uh, so generally speaking, in the context of special education, it's a, uh, a program that's designed to allow children to make meaningful educational progress uh, in all domains. A lot of times uh, schools may look at it really as academic needs, but it really goes far beyond academics. It does include social, emotional, behavioral, physical uh, needs, speech and language needs, uh, a variety of things that it can include. And that's all done through the provision of an individualized education program. What's also oftentimes really not considered is that 504, Section 504, also has its own requirement for the provision of, of FAPE, a free and appropriate public education. Um, while the, 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 the means to get to that, that, that FAPE uh, are, are different with the IDA having an IEP and Section 504 having a service agreement. Um, it really is, you know, FAPE is FAPE, if you, uh, if you will. And a lot of times uh, schools look at, uh, at the requirements of 504 as uh, what, I, what, I, what I refer to as FAPE light, kind of like, uh, kind of like Miller light, right? But it's, uh, it's really not. It's FAPE is FAPE is FAPE. Uh, so it does apply to both IDA and, and 504. Again, the vehicles, IEP versus the service plan are different, eligibility requirements are different, but that ultimate uh, obligation to provide FAPE uh, is in both of those laws. So kind of moving back into uh, to special education and, and the IDA, the purpose of, of providing the IEP and the purpose of guaranteeing a FAPE uh, to, to students is to allow a child to move to a reasonable level of independence and self-sufficiency uh, consistent with with their, their potential. So it really is to allow children to be as independent uh, members of society as they can once they, uh, once they graduate. The, as part of the requirement of FAPE, there's a requirement to provide uh, students specially designed instruction within their IEP. Uh, and that specially designed instruction needs to, be needs to be based on peer reviewed research. So it just can't be, you know, it's got, there's gotta have to be some sort of basis that this type of support is gonna work for students with the type of needs that your individual child um, uh, may have. Um, the requirement for FAPE, including under 504, uh, requires accommodations and supports uh, for students um, necessary to be able to access that their program and, and make that meaningful educational progress. 
and in students in, in within the context of special education and an IEP are also entitled to transition services that begin at least at the age of 16. Um, but in certain circumstances, uh, for certain students, it may be appropriate um, to uh, to start looking at and considering transition at even a uh, at even an earlier uh, an earlier age. So eligibility for for IDA. Uh, how do we how do we get entitlement to to these services? And really, there's it's a two part test. The first part is that a student has one of several enumerated disabilities uh, that the IDEA has. And because of that, um, has it, the disability is having an adverse impact on, on educational performance. Um, and again, we're talking about the specific disability. It's very specific uh, requirements for each of these disability categories under the IDEA. And that's what we're talking about for, for eligibility for the, for the IDEA. But uh, it goes beyond, you know, when we talk about, again, educational um, adverse educational impact, we are talking again about more than academics. We are talking about social, emotional, behavioral, speech and language, physical, all those things we talked about earlier, um, as far as what the IEP and what FAPE has to address uh, is part of that, that adverse uh, educational impact component of determining uh, eligibility. So that's the first part. The second part of that eligibility determination is that because of that disability and because of that uh, adverse impact uh, of the disability, the child requires specially designed instruction uh, in, in order to benefit from the, the, classroom, uh, the classroom instruction. So something more than a child would ordinarily get as a regular education student. That's essentially what specially designed instruction is. It is in, in essence, special education. So those are the, the, the two components. The biggest difference between eligibility under IDEA and eligibility under 504 is that specially designed instruction requirement. It's really kind of goes back to just a one, if you will, a one part test, having that, that, that disability that impacts a major life uh, activity, which could include learning. There's also no specific disability category. So any disability uh, can qualify you uh, under, uh, under section 504. So these are a few of the eligibility disability categories uh, under uh, the IDA. Uh, and these are the remaining uh, disability categories under the IDA. And again, it's one of those categories with an adverse impact and the requirement for specially designed instruction to be eligible. Okay. Child find is uh, the provision of the IDA that um, requires school districts and charter schools to identify students with special education needs. There, um, this includes students who are homeless, students who attend private schools. This is regardless of the disability, um, the severity of the disability. Um, school districts and charter schools are required to seek out, evaluate, and identify students with special education needs and who require who may require related services. So what this means is that. If a school district staff, teacher, guidance counselor, um, social worker, principal, who's working with the student in the in the um, school in the school building, uh, and this would be charter schools and school districts, sees a need of a suspected disability. So, for example, if a student is struggling academically, if a student is struggling socially. Um, either to appropriately get along with their peers and teachers, um, maybe they're withdrawn. If a student is um, struggling to regulate their emotions, having communication difficulties, speech and language needs, having handwriting needs, regulating their sensory um, integration. These are all areas where school districts and charter schools are obligated to refer that student for a special education evaluation. So if they are suspected of being a student with a disability and in need of special education, even if that child is making progress, even if they're advancing from grade to grade, if they're struggling, they need to be referred to an evaluation. And again, as Mike discussed, 
it's not just about academics. It's socially, emotionally, behaviorally, physically, in terms of speech and language communication needs, in areas of occupational handwriting, sensory integration. Um, and again, this would also include students who are highly mobile students, um, including migrant children. So uh, just one thing to, to add is uh, keep in mind, this is also an ongoing obligation for, for school districts. So sometimes the, the thought is that once we, once we identify the, 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 the child the first time for special education, we're kind of we're kind of done with child line, right? It's all it's all done. They're eligible. They have an IEP. Now it's just about the appropriateness of, of, of the the IEP, and that's really not true because a, a child's needs change, disability categories uh, that may not be you know as evident at a younger age might become more evident uh, at an at a uh, at a slightly older age. So, for example, um, executive functioning issues, right? So, a child gets identified in first grade, kindergarten, uh, second grade, the executive, the demands of executive function are not as high as those demands are gonna be when they get into fourth grade, fifth grade, middle school, high school. So that obligation to continue to identify child's, need, child's needs and, and how they should be identified and how they should be programmed for is all part of child fine and is a, a continuing and, and ongoing uh, obligation for, for kids. Um, so the, the process of, you know, all right, we suspect a child of being eligible, so now what? It's, we're moving into evaluating the child. Um, so that initial evaluation is required whenever there's a reason to suspect the child has a disability and needs special education. However, there's also requirements for reevaluations for students who are already um, uh, identified as eligible. And that's at a, a minimum of every three years, uh, unless a child's disability category is intellectual disability, uh, in which case the evaluation, the reevaluations must occur every two years. Uh, for uh, for those uh, for those children. So uh, in addition, um, if any team member has a concern, if you as the parent have a concern and think more information is necessary, an evaluation can be requested uh, more frequently than, or reevaluation can be requested more frequently than every three years uh, or every two years. There is a limit that a district only has to do a formal evaluation once a year. Um, but other than that, you can certainly request more thorough evaluations. And keep in mind, you know, if a, if a district does an evaluation and they're focusing primarily on some, you know, cognitive, academic achievement, testing, maybe speech and language, but they really don't get into social, emotional, behavioral issues and social, emotional, behavior issues come up sooner than that one year. I think in that circumstance, a parent could say, like, hey, you never evaluated those social emotional aspects as part of this evaluation. So I want you to evaluate them now. There's another option that we'll talk about in a minute as well in that, in that circumstance where they didn't do the full evaluation the, uh, the first time, but there's a, a lot of opportunity, um, I should say to request uh, evaluations, both by the, by the school district as well as by the, uh, by the parents. So the scope of the evaluation, uh, whether it's an initial evaluation or a reevaluation, is making sure that that evaluation is comprehensive and thorough. So the specific language of the law says that it has to be su sufficiently comprehensive to identify all of the child's special education and related services needs, whether or not those needs are typically connected to the disability category in which uh, you know, the student is classified. So, you know, just because a student is um, classified in as a learning dis disabled child doesn't necessarily mean we won't do assessments or the district shouldn't do assessments outside of just academic, standardized academic achievement testing and, and, uh, and cognitive um, assessments. So a good way to look at this, look at the evaluation process, whether it's a uh, a reevaluation or a initial evaluation is it's, it's better when a, if a school district is kind of identifying what the problem is, what the concerns are, what the areas of needs are that we're seeing, and then kind of doing 
what they often refer to as a kind of a rule out procedure for uh, for for the assessment. So in other words, the, this is the presenting problem or concern. Now I'm going to go through and kind of rule out what is the cause of that problem, and that helps to to not miss uh, a a particular area as opposed to going in and somebody is struggling in, um, you know, is having behavioral issues. So we go in and we kind of ignore academic achievement testing. We focus in on behavior, but had they done a, a rule out, maybe they would have found that there was a learning disability and it's that learning disability and the struggles that they're having in the classroom that is causing the, uh, the behaviors that they are, are seeing in the, in the classroom. So that, that kind of rule out uh, procedure for a school district evaluation is uh, is really uh, important in this uh, in this context. Uh, there is a well, it's really not a new procedure anymore. It's uh, it's it, the procedure came out. I think Heather right, it was two thousand and four amendments. I think is when this uh, procedure came out for a specific yes. determining a specific learning disability, which is a response to intervention uh, model is which is now the the preferred model as opposed to the the, the ability achievement model, uh, which is the looking at cognitive functioning and comparing it to standardized uh, achievement uh, and determining whether there's a significant discrepancy between the, between the two. Um, I will say that despite this, you know, being the preferred model since 2004, um, I would say the by far the vast majority of school districts in the state of Pennsylvania continue to use a, a uh, ability achievement uh, discrepancy model as opposed to the response to intervention model. Um, Pennsylvania Department of Education has also kind of put together some requirements and you have to be, you have to be officially approved um, by the Pennsylvania Department of, of Education to use the response to intervention model to show that you're doing it correctly before you're able to make that your model for determining specific learning disability. And that list is very, very small. Um, and, uh, and there really has not been a push to, uh, to switch. And if they're not on, if the school district is not on that list, doesn't have that uh, approval, it can't, according to, to the Pennsylvania Department of Education, use the response to intervention model, which is actually a little contradictory to the, to the IDA regulations, which specifically state that a school district, while they, they cannot be required to use a ability achievement model, but that's essentially what Pennsylvania um, in fact does. Uh, if they haven't been approved, they have to use the ability uh, achievement model. So uh, most continue to, to do that. Okay, uh, parents also have a right in the context of evaluations to obtain an independent educational evaluation, oftentimes at public expense. So. A parent is entitled to an independent evaluation at their own expense at any time they want it. Um, they are entitled to it at public expense when the district's last evaluation was not comprehensive. It wasn't appropriate, thorough, and comprehensive to address all areas of, of need. Um, there, it's a unique area of the law in that when a request for a publicly funded independent evaluation is made, a school district has two options. They can either grant the request and fund it, or they can initiate a due process hearing on their own to defend the appropriateness of their last evaluation. That's the only two, that's the only two options. Now, sometimes when you have an attorney involved or even without attorneys, they'll talk about, well, we'll agree to it if, and kind of have some conversations. That's, that's fine for the district to try and explore some sort of resolution to the request, but within a reasonable time, they need to ultimately, if, if, if you as the, the parent are not open to that, the school district has to make a determination of one of, two, of, one of those two options and then move forward with that within a reasonable, um, within a reasonable period of time. Um, again, you, when you are requesting uh, a independent educational evaluation, it, you, you can request, people look at it as, um, you know, you only have the, the, the right to request one independent evaluation at a time, uh, which means you ask, if you ask for an independent evaluation for 
um, uh, let's say a neuropsychological speech and language and, and a functional behavior assessment that you'll get a response. Well, you got to pick one. You can only have, you can only have one. And that's really not, that's really not true. That is one. I mean, they are right that it's one, but all three of those is one comprehensive evaluation, just like when the school district does a comprehensive evaluation, it's not just a psychological or neuropsychological evaluation. It can include other components based on the child's needs, speech and language, functional behavior assessment, occupational therapy. And there's no one evaluator that's doing all those assessments, right? It's like you're pulling in multidisciplinary team members to, to do that. Uh, and it's the same thing on the, on the independent uh, educational evaluation side. So the individualized education plan or program is the plan by which students receive special education services and specially designed instruction. It is the written statement that each child with a disability um, receives. It's developed, reviewed, revised. That happens in a, in a meeting with parents or guardians and relevant professionals. An IEP meeting should happen at least annually. So at least once a year, your, your child's, um, each student's IEP will be reviewed, developed the first year and then reviewed each additional year. However, you can call an IEP meeting. Um, the district can call an IEP meeting. Parents can call an IEP meeting. Um, if, if there's a reason for, uh, let's say, after the first quarter of your child's implementation of their IEP, that you're noticing that they're not they're not really making progress that you that you would expect them to be making. Maybe they're still struggling um, significantly in reading, um, even though implementation of a research based reading program has been implemented all quarter or half the school year. Uh, maybe you're not seeing any progress in terms of their articulation needs and they're receiving speech and language services. So you can call and, and um, ask for another IEP meeting and say, I don't think my child's making progress. Maybe we need to make some revisions. Maybe we need to talk about other programs that should be implemented, or maybe we need to increase services. So again, that IEP should happen at least annually um, and can be reviewed and revised um, periodically throughout the school year. We're gonna go through the components of um, an IEP, starting with, so the IEP should be based on a sufficient evaluation, which Mike talked about. And in terms of um, once you receive a sufficient evaluation from the district, you will you should have a complete understanding of your child's complete educational needs. The first section or towards the beginning of the IEP after the signature pages, there's a section uh, that is present levels of education. So that includes uh, statements about your child's present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. Oh, if. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, so in terms of their academic achievement, that section should give you this this section should be specific and include a lot of inf information uh, remember we're going to be developing the goals based on those present levels of academic achievement and functional performance so we want to have a lot of detail and understanding of what your child's needs are so for example with regard to academic achievement reading has several different components to it we don't just want to see something uh, along the lines of uh, Jonathan is reading on a third grade level. We want to know specifically, is um, Jonathan able to f um, phonetically decode words? At what level are they doing that? Are they able to fluently read? How quickly are they reading? How is their vocabulary? How is their reading comprehension? And that information should be provided based on either curriculum-based assessments or um, academic achievement assessments. So we have some objective standardized um, information in terms of where your child is functioning academically. Again, remember, we have to develop goals um, based on these present levels of education. And in terms of functional performance, functional performance, we're talking about all other areas of education besides academics. So socially, 
how is your child doing socially? Are there areas of um, need? Are there areas of strength in terms of their emotional regulation, speech and language services, behavioral functioning, executive functioning, how's their planning and organizing, transitioning from task to task, occupational therapy, handwriting, sensory integration, if they have physical therapy needs, what are those needs? Um, so, and then again, we're going to be taking that information from the present levels of education, academic achievement, and functional performance, and developing measurable annual goals. So the next section of the IEP, we should have measurable annual goals, and that would be goals for areas of academic and areas for functional goals. So what do we mean by measurable? Measurable means that we have to be able to measure the progress in each area of goal. Um, so we don't want something simply to say, Mary will improve in um, engaging with her peers, initiating with her peers socially. What does that mean? We want all children to improve. So we need something, we need a baseline. We need to determine what areas of need the child has socially and determine a baseline for specifically, maybe she's initiating with her peers um, zero times a day. And then we want a goal, an annual goal for how many times we want her initiating with her peers. Um, these goals will be uh, um, progress monitored and we can talk about um, on the next slide, Mike, sorry. In terms of, in terms of the next, in that goal section of the IEP, we need to do, include a description of how the child's progress towards meeting the goals will be measured. So how are we measuring that progress? Again, if we have a baseline and a measurable goal, we need to have a method for measuring the progress. For um, when we talk about uh, areas of need and we're implementing a research-based program, I always feel that if there is a progress monitoring um, component to that research-based program, ideally you want to be progress monitoring using that progress monitoring tool. So for example, uh, if your child has a uh, reading decodes reading needs in the areas of decoding and receiving a phonics based research based reading program such as Wilson or an Orton Gillingham program typically there is going to be a progress monitoring component to that program so Wilson has levels so you could have a goal that includes a baseline of what level the child's currently at and then the annual goal of what level you the child should um, reach at the end of the school year. Remember that in terms of determining that goal, that annual goal, we want that to be a realistic goal, but also we don't want it to be set too low where there's too low of um, an expected level of achievement. Sometimes I see that too often where the goal is set that yes, the child's going to meet it, but if we continue on that path, the child's not truly making a lot of meaningful educational progress. Um, so we wanna make sure that that goal is, is in line with that student's um, abilities and what we can expect them to make in terms of over a, a school year. In terms of, I'm sorry, Mike, if we could go Where back, I just wanted from? one. How often the periodic reports will be provided should also be in the goal section of the IEP. So typically you will see that periodic, the um, IEP progress monitoring is provided quarterly. Report cards go out quarterly. So you tend to get your child's IEP progress monitoring quarterly. And sometimes that may be fine, but there may be times where Quarter, uh, quarterly is not sufficient and we need more frequent progress uh, progress monitoring pr reports provided to parents. So for example, if we have a student that has behavioral needs, I don't think it's appropriate to wait till the end of the quarter to report progress for a student that's having significant behavioral needs. We want that progress monitoring report to go to the parents on a more frequent basis so that the parent knows um, how their child is doing behaviorally, and we can address that um, 
more if there's if there's concerns we can address that throughout the throughout the quarter The next session of the IEP includes a statement of special education and related services, as well as supplementary aids and services based on peer-reviewed research. So the IEP should have what we call specially designed instruction and accommodations. Um, what does your child need that the typically developing child would not need to receive. So for example, if your child has a reading disability and needs to receive a research-based reading program, that would be a multi-sensory research-based reading program, phonics-based reading program. That is part of specially designed instruction. Uh, peer, what we mean by peer-reviewed research is that it's been tested and proven to be effective. So we know that Wilson, for example, a phonics-based reading program has been proven to be effective for students that have decoding or phonics-based reading needs. In terms of related services, Mike's going to talk a little bit more about those. Um, and then supports for um, school personnel. We want to make sure that in the um, IEP, there's a section that has what supports for school personnel. Uh, sorry, Mike, it's back a couple slides. Um, so what supports for school personnel uh, does, does your child need to support this IEP, to be able to implement this IEP? So for example, um, and you will typically see things in this section that um, uh, there uh, may be consultation between speech and language therapist and um, special education teacher or regular education teachers so that there's um, communication between uh, what are those child's needs and how can that be um, addressed in the classroom. What I also like to see in that section is if your child has a need that maybe a regular education teacher doesn't have a full understanding that they receive training in that area of need. So for example, um, understanding your students' executive functioning needs and how that's going to impact them in the classroom. Sometimes regular education teachers don't always have that understanding. So there needs to be um, training and consultation so that they have a full understanding of your child's needs so they can implement that IEP effectively in that regular education setting. The IEP should also explain the extent to which your child will not be participating with their non-disabled peers. So there's a section in the IEP that explains to what extent your child's going to be in regular education as opposed to in special education settings. The IEP will also include um, a statement of individual appropriate accommodations that are necessary to measure the academic achievement and functional performance of your child on state and district-wide assessments. So what accommodations do they need for the um, PSSA testing or Keystone testing that would be included in your child's IEP? All right, related services. So. Uh, related services are essentially those those additional services uh, that a child may require uh, in order to access their 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 program. So it may not be the may not be the the primary basis for for uh, for the eligibility or for their program, but it's necessary for them in order to access and, and, and the program and, and receive faith. And related services can be a variety of things. The, the, this slide and the next slide are some examples of related services, but by no means is it by no means is it an exhaustive list of, of potential um, services. Something, some things that are often um, left out, not not thought about in the context of uh, related services. Uh, there's a few, and I'll I'll hit on those. Uh, so the the diagnostic medical services. So oftentimes you will you will hear that school districts are not responsible 
uh, for medical services. And that technically is correct. They are not responsible for providing medical services that are required to be done by a doctor, right? So nursing services, they would have an obligation to do. It's not a doctor, right? But that applies to the provision of, of services and, uh, you know, going to see your doctor for a medical appointment, et cetera. Um, that does not include um, diagnostic or medical assessments if those assessments are necessary to being able to determine what types of supports and accommodations and services a child needs in school. So diagnostic medical services um, uh, is uh, a possibility of a related services for a child. Parent counseling and training is another one that you rarely see on uh, on, a, on an IEP. And this is to provide parents training on how to address their own child's needs and how to support how to support their child, uh, as well as kind of bigger picture issues about their child's disability uh, and uh, about different services that they their child may be uh, receiving. Districts can do this in a variety of ways. They can make you know some of their more general training available. Uh, to families to attend that they provide for their for their teachers, but that's also having some specific consultation or teachers or related service providers working directly with a parent to assist the parent in learning about their child's needs and, and how their child's needs should be should be met met. Um, and I, for those who may not be familiar with with it, um, uh, PATAM uh, in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania. Um, Training and Technical Assistance Network is what it stands for. They offer um, trainings, uh, many of which are virtual. Some are located in are, are in person in a, a, one of their three locations in the western part, middle, and uh, and eastern part of the state. But many are virtual. Many, most are free, and most are open to anybody, including uh, parents. And they actually do a pretty good job. Up, uh, in their in their training and the programming uh, that they uh, that they put out there, um, our office will often attend uh, those trainings uh, about new new educational technologies, methodologies, uh, and the like. So um, I encourage you to 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 go on to Tan's website. You can there's a, a link for their calendar, and you can see all the different. Um, uh, trainings that they're offering, whether they're in personal, in person or virtual, uh, and uh, avail yourself of those. Again, they're typically at no charge. Uh, and in most cases, anybody can attend. There's some when you read the descriptions that clearly, um, you know, you need to be part of a team and the team is attending or it's, you know, sometimes if it's through schoolology and depending on, on whether or not you have it, you may or may not be able to, to, to access it. But uh, and these are some other um, uh, uh, services. Um, and, and one here that is often missed is the psychological services. They'll do counseling, uh, but they won't do uh, psychological services, which is services from a psychologist. And sometimes that level of support for a child with emotional uh, needs uh, is really necessary. So uh, that is another one that's often uh, underlooked. Uh, recreation uh, is also one that is often um, overlooked depending on uh, a child's, you know, that's part of being a, a, you know, a healthy adult, being able to, uh, to recreate, if you will, uh, and, uh, and sometimes providing them instruction on how to do that and, and develop those skills is also something that a child needs depending on their specific, um, their specific needs. Heather? So and before we move into the real, district environment, there are questions. Um, Mike, I don't yeah, know. If I can't you... open it. Can you? Are you able to open the Q and A? Sure, sure. I can't. So, um, so the first one is how how can how can we tell the assessments done for secondary transition planning are adequate and appropriate? Where to find resources about such assessments? So there, I, I, and Heather, if you disagree, I don't know that there's any, any outline or, you know, bright line definition of what is an appropriate transition assessment. I think it depends on the, 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 the individual student. 
Um, and I think it depends too on what the student and the family are saying. This is kind of the direction we want to go with, you know, with uh, a um, with our 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 student and where where the child wants to go uh, on on those, and then tailoring that based on based on the child. So you know, if a ch if the child's post secondary outcome is you know uh, X, it's a uh, I don't know, they want to be a police officer, they want to be a, a mechanic, whatever it is. All right, what, by the time they graduate to take that next step, right? What's the, what are the, what, what things do they need to know, right? What do they, what skills do they need to have to be able to take the next step after they leave, um, leave high school? And then I think you're building an assessment around those skills and assessing those, those skills, where are they in those skills? And then your transition programming is working on those skills. So it's gonna be very, very different. You know, if it's, if post-secondary is just, you know, they, they're gonna get a job right out of high school and then they're gonna, you know, you know, what skills do we need for that job, both from a social interpersonal uh, standpoint, being able to follow, uh, you know, directions from their supervisor, being able to stay focused on a task um, to to completion, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever the skills are related to their post-secondary, whether it's, you know, moving on to some future education, whether, you know, vocational or academic, whether it's getting a job, whether it's moving to, uh, you know, uh, to some sort of um, supported employment, uh, supported living arrangement, you know, so it could be more focused on daily living skills. It could be more focused on academics, the, the, both the assessment and the transition programming, depending on what they, what they're looking for. What do you think, Heather? Okay. And, um, next question is, are schools confused about how paperwork is handled when a student has both a 504 and IEP? They do not feel that 504 accommodations are added to an IEP. My understanding is if a student has both the 504, has both the 504 that merges into the IEP document. So, um, I don't, I don't know about you, Mike, but I have not seen situations typically when a student has a 504 and then maybe it becomes eligible for an IEP, yet those accommodations from the 504 would go into the IEP. They wouldn't have both a 504 and an IEP. That typically those, I, I have not seen situations where, and I've been doing this a long time, where a 504 would be a separate document from an, an IEP. Agreed. Both an IEP and a 504 include accommodations and supports that a child would, would require. The IEP just goes further and is getting into special design instruction and those kinds of things beyond what the 504 does. So there's nothing in a 504 plan that would not also be in, in an IEP. Um, and there's no, there's no reason that I can think of that you would have both. Agree. Um, and then the, uh, as a follow-up question that is there guidance for the combined documents? Uh, again, 504 plans include accommodations and IEP includes accommodations and specially designed instruction. So it doesn't really make sense to have a 504 plan and an IEP. If your child's eligible, if a student's eligible for an IEP, whatever accommodations they need that maybe they receive pursuant to a 504 plan would now go into their IEP document. Um, so next question, Mike, when a child is on an IEP, would the school give the child help or extra time to complete her PSSA? Uh, if you want to take that one. Yeah, yes, you can make, you can make, uh, accommodations for the PSSA, uh, um, or now moving into the, to the, the, uh, the keystones, um, uh, you, yes, you can get accommodations, the type of accommodations or exactly what kind of accommodations are limited by the assessment. So, um, but they can absolutely, um, make accommodations. One of which is certainly extended time, uh, to, uh, to take, 
the assessment. And that's actually when you go through the IEP uh, towards the beginning after the present ed levels, but before you get into the goals, there is a section about the, you know, the PSSAs uh, or keystones and uh, district-wide assessments and what accommodations uh, a child may, may require. And, you know, they should be addressed there as far as what, you know, what, what needs to be um, done. There's also, you know, a requirement as it relates to, 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 to keystones. Well, PSSA, depending on the child, there was a requirement that, that you could do the, the PASA, the PASA, which was an alternative assessment to the PSSA. And within the keystone, there is, alter, there is a uh, alternative pathway to what they refer to as an alternative pathway to graduation, other than the, the keystone, if because of the child's disability, uh, or frankly, even if not, because even if it's a regular education student and they're having difficulty uh, with uh, the keystone assessment, uh, 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 creating another pathway to get to graduation other than taking the uh, other than taking the keystone. But short answer is yes, you can have accommodations on those kinds of, of assessments, including STEM. And, and I would just add that it, it again, like Mike said, it's going to be limited. Um, you know, there's only so many accommodations that the, the testing will allow you to do, um, but it, it's going to be based on the, 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 the disability. So like Mike said, you might get extra time. Um, Distraction-free environment is another one you might commonly see. So um, next then, question. Sorry, ahead. Mike. Nope. Can you talk about how to get my child's school to evaluate her for an IEP. I've been asking in writing and they are not responding to me. Is there a timeline A timeline that the school must follow? Yes, yeah, so yes. Um, I don't know how long you've been asking, but if you have um, requested uh, to evaluate and you have that in writing, the district has to respond um, within a reasonable time frame, either by agreeing to evaluate or issuing what's called a notice of recommended educational placement or NORAP, denying the um, the request for an evaluation and explaining the reason why they're denying that request. Um, so that's definitely something that um, uh, they they need to respond to. Um, and if you if you need our help, we're happy to help. Yeah, the, the Pennsylvania regulations, I believe, for specifically where a parent makes the request for an evaluation in writing, defines the reasonable time. It's either 10 days or 15 days. I can't recall which, but it's a short period of time in which they need to either issue that, that nor denying, uh, to which you can disagree. You can disagree and initiate due process and ask a hearing officer to order the district to, uh, to evaluate or alternatively issuing you a formal permission to evaluate for you to sign and give them the consent uh, that they need to do that uh, do that evaluation. Thanks, Mike. So on to least restrictive environment. Um, so least restrictive environment is um, uh, under the um, IDA. Students must be provided with, we want them and educate it with their typically developing steer, peers, excuse me, typically developing peers to the maximum extent appropriate. So this includes children that are in public and private institutions or other care facilities. So we start with the regular education environment and we work our way out. Sorry, Mike, next yeah, slide. I'm sorry, I'm, it's not moving on me, there we go. No, back, I'm sorry, back one. So special classes, separate schooling, or other removal of children with disabilities from regular education environment should only happen if the nature and severity of the disability is such that the education in the regular education class with the use of supplementary aids and services, and that's the full range of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved satisfactorily. So we don't want, if it's, let's say we have a child that's struggling in regular education, uh, socially, emotionally, behaviorally, we wouldn't automatically take that child and put them in emotional support uh, setting. 
to be educated in. We would want to implement the full range of supplementary aids and services in that regular education environment before we would move them into a more, what we call a more restrictive environment. And that's the same for moving a child into um, a, a, a more restrictive school building. So sometimes students that have um, significant social, emotional, behavioral needs may be placed into um, a, a private school to address those needs. That should only happen if we've we've already tried the full range of supplementary aids and services within that regular school building. So again, we want students to be with their typically developing peers to the maximum extent appropriate. Similarly with um, if you have a student that has a learning disability, they may need to be in a learning support setting for their area of need, say reading or math, written expression, but then they could be out in regular education and receive regular education instruction for science and social studies. The materials can be adapted to their grade level um, that they're that they're functioning on. Um, they can be in uh, all other classes uh, throughout the school day in the regular education setting, specials and art, um, music. Um, they could be with their peers during lunch. Um, so we, again, we wanna start with that regular education setting and work our way out. And we want students with um, their typically developing peers to the maximum extent appropriate. And also, a... sorry, Mike. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. There's a, um... There used to, used to be called the the SAS toolkit, the Supplementary Aids and Services Toolkit. They've changed the name. It's now called the Framework for Access and Belonging. Uh, it's put out by the TAN, um, the same organization we, we mentioned earlier. And it's a great uh, kind of, it's almost like a questionnaire to kind of go through to determine, you know, what has been done as far as Supplementary Aids and Services to make the regular education environment um, accessible and appropriate for a student with supports and accommodations before moving to that next that next level. And you know, if you're having a conversation with your school district and you are not ready yet, you haven't come to the opinion where you think your child should move to a more restrictive environment, asking them whether or not they've done or will they do uh, and sit down and do the SAS toolkit or the, the framework uh, for access and belonging through the TAN before making the determination that we need to go to a more uh, more restrictive environment. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So uh, the child's placement should be determined at least annually, so at least once a year. And then um, based on the child's individualized education program. And we want the child as close to the child's home as possible. So we um, want that child in their regular school district. And if there's um, several different elementary schools, we want the child in the elementary school that's close to the child's home. Again, sometimes uh, a child needs more services to address their needs that and need to be placed in, say, another building in the district that has more supports and services. Again, uh, as long as that is the least restrictive environment to the maximum extent appropriate. So again, we want that child with their typically developing peers and closest to home um, to meet their needs. All right, uh, extended school year services. These are services beyond the regular 180 day uh, school year. Um, the, you know, the general rule in the IDA is that students are entitled to, to extend the school year services if they need it in order to receive FAPE. You know, what that means um, and how we determine eligibility has been further expanded upon and explained by, by uh, a variety of different uh, court decisions. And we'll talk about that in, in a second. Um, but a, there has to be a discussion of extended school year services at every IEP meeting um, for students with severe disabilities, which includes things like uh, autism, intellectual disability, emotional disturbance. Um, you know, it excludes things like uh, learning disability, other health impairment, um, uh, but uh, if if, it, if uh, a student falls into one of those more severe disability categories, then a decision 
regarding eligibility for extended school year must be made by February 28th, the February 28th prior to that summer. Uh, with the, the NORA detailing what the program is going to be uh, issued to the family by March 31st. So those are those timelines. If not, if, if the child does not fall into one of those, they have to make the eligibility determination and the um, uh, and issue the NORA, uh, you know, in a reasonable enough time in advance of extended school year so that you can address uh, any issues uh, with respect to disagreements over that eligibility or, or programming uh, with the understanding that extended school year services hearings are expedited. It's one of the, there's only two times that hearings are expedited and the timelines are very quick. Extended school year is one of them because typically you're even, you know, even February, March timeframe, you're, you've got a relatively limited period of time um, before there's going to be a, a the program is going to start, so we need to get through that due process procedure if if there's no agreement um, quicker than we might get through the ordinary uh, due process uh, due process procedure. So the factors for determining eligibility, um, I think most 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 of you that maybe already whose kids have IEPs and you've gone through this have probably heard about regression and recoupment. Um, that is the, that's the, the, the uh, I guess for lack of a better word, the typical uh, uh, one that is focused on and, and used. And essentially what that is looking at is one, whether or not the child regresses over, uh, over extended breaks from, from, uh, from education. Uh, and if so, whether uh, the child is able to recoup those skills and how how closely they're able to recoup those skills, particularly in regard to IEP goals uh, in the in the IEP. Um, to some degree, every child regresses, um, uh, particularly over the the, the summer break, um, which is why there's always the very beginning of the school year. A lot of times is a review of you know what they should have learned the year before um, because of that. But typically, kids are able to recoup those lost skills relatively quickly. For kids that are eligible, the regression is either far more significant or the time to recoup those skills is far longer, which then puts us, you know, in a in a situation where your students are losing a significant amount of time in the school year before they've recouped those skills uh, and are able to move on uh, from where they were at the end of the at the end of the, the previous year. So that's the most typical way that school districts um find students eligible or not it's not the only way although oftentimes i think the other factors uh get ignored so the factors are, are listed here it's interruption of a, of a potential mastered skill so you have a skill that you are kind of close to uh to mastering consolidating at the point when programming would would be interrupted uh achieving self-sufficiency and independence is another factor so we're looking at to the extent to which a particular skill or behavior is crucial for a student to meet uh, IEP goals related to self-sufficiency and independence from caretakers. That can be a ground to, uh, to be eligible for extended school year. Withdraw from academics. So the, you know, this comes to the, to the extent to which a, a, a student, because of interruptions to educational programming, tend to withdraw from the learning process that can make a child eligible. And the severity of the disability, whether the, the disability is so severe, such as autism, pervasive development disorder, emotional disturbance, intellectual disabilities, et cetera, that that in and of itself, it's so severe that it makes the child eligible for extended uh, school year services. So those are the other factors in addition to the, to the regression uh, recruitment. Determinations on eligibility need to be made based on data and, uh, and information um, that includes, and you got a list here of the different types of data. It could be progress on goals, progress reports from team members, parent reports, uh, medical or other agency reports, um, challenges that are increased during breaks, observations and opinions, test results, criteria and reference tests, curriculum based assessments, and life skills uh, assessments. So, all that, and again, this is just examples of sources of data 
that should be considered and reviewed in making that determination about, about eligibility. And then that will ultimately lead to what the, what the extended school year program should look like. And it is not, um, despite the practice, it is not a one size fits uh, approach when it comes to extended school year. So while a district's typical extended school year program may be four to six weeks over the summer, four days, you know, four half days or four full days a week or whatever it is, that fine and it may be appropriate for the vast majority of kids uh, in the extended school year um, uh, program, but it doesn't mean that it's appropriate for all of them. And if a, if a child in order to have an appropriate extended school year service program is, needs something different than that standard, then they're entitled to that something different. It is not a one size fits uh, approach. Discipline, um, uh, as, we're, as, we're, as we're getting closer to the end of the, the, the uh, participation, we could spend hours just on, on discipline, back to school time, uh, kids having been out for, for uh, any kid having been out all summer long, never mind uh, children with disabilities that might be dealing with uh, uh, you know, ADHD, social emotional issues, behavioral issues to start with. Now we're back in that, in that structure of, of school, you know, we tend to get, uh, we tend to get disciplinary issues. We tend to get them at the beginning, mostly at the beginning of school. And then we get a lot at the end of the, the school year when they've kind of had, had, had enough uh, at the end. So it's important to be, uh, be aware of what these protections are. Students get protections if they're eligible under the IDA, eligible under section 504 or thought to be eligible students. Thought to be eligible students are, it's a very specific category. It is where a, uh, a parent has expressed a concern in writing uh, to, to the teacher or administration, where a teacher has expressed a concern to administration or their direct supervisor, uh, or where a parent has requested an evaluation prior to the, uh, to the incident uh, occurring, and the district hasn't evaluated and determined non-eligibility. Non uh, in those circumstances, those thought to be eligible students are entitled to the same protections that a already identified eligible student would be entitled to. What are those protections? So uh, under both 504 and IDA, a district cannot exclude a, uh, a student from school for more than 10 consecutive days uh, if the behavior is a manifestation of the, the student's uh, disability. It's technically actually 10 days uh, potentially 10 days, whether consecutive or cumulative. And we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, there is no formal manifestation determination procedure under 504. There is a formal procedure under the, under the IDA. However, a determination as to whether there's a connection or a nexus between the disability and the behavior for which discipline is gonna be applied still has to occur under 504. The easiest way for a district to make sure they're complying with 504 is to simply do the manifestation determination that's outlined uh, in the IDA. Although technically they do not have to do that procedure if a student is only eligible under, uh, 50, under 504. Uh, there is uh, a explicit stay put or pendency provisions uh, with regard to the IDA when there's disagreements and dispute, not the case under section 504. Uh, and uh, a student, even if expelled, even if they're able to be expelled and it's not a manifestation, um, they are still entitled to FAPE out after that uh, expulsion. They're just not entitled to FAPE within the least restrictive environment at that point because of the, because of the, uh, the expulsion. Uh, any, um, and you know what, I don't think I mention it. Um, I'm just looking, nope. We do uh, any um, any removal of a student with an intellectual disability is considered a change of placement. So it doesn't matter if it's one day, fifteen days, twenty days. It's uh, it's a considered a change of placement and, and prohibited. Um, and that's a, a specific Pennsylvania rule. That's not a federal rule. That's something that Pennsylvania does. However, that does not apply to a forty-five day interim alternative educational setting that Heather will explain. Uh, shortly exactly what that is. So um, cumulative days, okay, um, uh, can exist 
uh, can also count. So it's where it is a, uh, there's a pattern of serial ex ex suspensions um, will be prohibited when those suspensions exceed 10 days in a school year, not consecutive, just 10 days in a school year. And the pattern looks like a change in placement of the length of each suspension. Are they you know, similar in length, proximity of time, are they close together and the total time uh, out of school? Pennsylvania has a rule that automatically says it's a change in placement if the cumulative days exceed 15 in a school year. So in Pennsylvania, at most, it's 15 cumulative days or 10 consecutive. In other states, it could exceed 15 cumulative, depending on how this analysis goes with respect to a, a, a serial uh, suspensions, but it's cut off at, at 15 days um, in, uh, in, in, in Pennsylvania. Okay, so and there are situations where a student, a special education student, even if it's a manifestation of even if they um, engage in a behavior that is a manifestation of their disability can be placed into an, an, an alternative um, school setting for up to 45 days. And uh, these are known as exceptions. And uh, the first one is if the student carries a dangerous weapon into school. If a student know, knowingly uses or possesses illegal drugs or buys or sells controlled substance. If they cause serious bodily injury against um, someone else. These are all situations where the um, school district or charter school can unilaterally a student, a special education student into a 45 day interim alternative educational placement. Um, another situation that would be a, a hearing officer could determine, a special education hearing officer could determine um, if the student presents a danger to themselves or others. In these situations um, where the student can be placed in a 45 day placement, the good news is, is they still are the school district and charter school is still required to provide a free appropriate public education to that student while they're in that placement. Yeah, and you can challenge whether or not they did what they're claiming or the, the exception applies. They go anyway um, to the 45 day during any, any challenge and behavioral discipline issues is the other area you get an expedited um, due process hearing. And then just one thing to point out the weapons and, and possess of illegal drugs are defined by the federal crimes code, not the school district's uh, um, code of conduct. So if it's illegal to possess your own Ritalin uh, or prescription, whatever it might be, and your child has it and they're violating the school code, this rule would not apply because it's not illegal for them to have their own prescription on, on them. It's not an illegal drug under the, the, uh, under the, the crimes code. Now, if if the student is a bit of an entrepreneur, uh, if you will, and is uh, selling their prescription to other kids, that's a different story. Now it is. Now it is under the uh, the uh, the uh, the crimes code, uh, uh, the the selling of a controlled substance. So, uh, but it's it's as defined by federal law, not as defined by the schools uh, the schools uh, um, code of conduct. And a formal hearing um, is required when there is a removal from school for more than 10 days. So that formal hearing would uh, um, require the school district to um, have a meeting to determine whether the behavior was a manifestation of this child's disability. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So at the manifestation determination hearing, there will be two questions that will the team will determine. Was the conduct in question caused by or had a direct and substantial relationship to the child's disability? So in making that determination, uh, medical records, psychosocial records, academic disciplinary records can all be reviewed. And there's several factors um, that that should be um, reviewed in making that determination. So whether the student has a significant disability that may result in impaired judgment and or reasoning. In other words, was the student able or would the student 
be considered to have the ability to understand what the behavior in uh, that the behavior in question was wrong. Another factor is determining the effect of severe emotional disturbance, so such as schizophrenia, major depressive episodes, suicidal ideation, and whether there is evidence that it had a direct relationship to the student's behavior. Determining whether the student has a neurological impairment or medical condition that directly impacts or produces involuntary or uncontrollable behavior. So, for example, Tourette syndrome or seizure disorder. Whether, whether the medical condition has a direct relationship to the behavior. So, for example, violating a no smoking rule in school is typically not the result of Tourette syndrome or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Determining whether the student has shown a history of voluntary control of the behavior in question. So based on what is known or can be learned about the student, did that student have the ability to control the behavior in question? Would it have been difficult for the student to control his or her actions? And determining if the student in an escalated emotional state can recall the knowledge to produce the ability to perform the skill. So those are the factors in looking at that first question. you were going to do the direct result of the failure to implement. Okay. And then the second question in um, determining whether the student's behavior was a manifestation of their disability is, uh, was the conduct in question a direct result of the local educational agency's failure to implement a proper IEP? So in looking at the, that question, we would determine if the student was uh, um, deriving educational benefit from his or her program if the student were uh, the student's needs were being addressed through an IP um, if the uh, we would determine if positive behavior support plan is present if that's appropriate if it's being implemented as designed uh, we would review progress monitoring data, both academic and behavioral evaluations and diagnostic information, classroom and student observations, teacher, staff, parent, student interview, and review specially designed instruction related services, supports for school personnel as specified in the student's IEP, and were the necessary resources available as part of the student's um, program. So if the answer is no to both questions, then the district may proceed with the suspension or expulsion hearing. If the answer is yes to either, either of those questions, so one or the other, then the district may not proceed with the um, suspension or expulsion. And also, if the, um, if the answer is yes to, um, to one, uh, to uh, one or both of those questions. The IEP team must also conduct a functional behavior assessment unless the LEA had just conducted a functional behavior assessment shortly before um, the behavior had uh, that resulted in the, the need for the manifestation determination. Um, and in addition, uh, if the answer is yes, then a positive behavior support plan needs to be developed. If one has already been developed, it should be reviewed, modified as necessary. A manifestation determination must be made immediately, but no later than 10 days after a decision to pursue a disciplinary expulsion. And if the behavior was not a manifestation and the district seeks to change the student's placement, parents must be provided with written notice of that decision and that they have the opportunity to disagree and to initiate due process proceedings. The district must follow chapter 12 requirements, um, which provides uh, rights and protections such as um, uh, having notice, um, having the ability to call witnesses, cross-examine witnesses, right to representation. It's the chapter 12 is the 
expulsion requirements for any any student in in uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, whether whether they have a disability or or, uh, or not. So um, just a few things to keep in mind about due process, and this is how due process is one of the ways in which you can challenge any of the determinations made by a district or or if you think the district failed to do something that they were supposed to do in any of the areas that we uh, that we discussed um, this evening. Uh, before I talk about due process hearings, there is also the ability to ask for mediation, uh, which is a little less uh, a uh, little less formal, a little less uh, adversarial. Uh, me, there's a meet you're it's involved with a mediator. You can decide I'm not going to have an attorney, in which case the school district's not allowed to have an attorney, um, or you can decide you want to have an attorney and then they will have one. Um, but you're going a mediator is trying to get both sides to, to try and move on their positions and come to, to an agreement. Nobody's going to make a decision uh, at, a, uh, at a mediation. The other option is the, the due process hearing. So uh, that's where uh, a hearing officer is being appointed, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> appointed by the state. Um, and uh, you're going to address your issues and concerns uh, with that hearing officer. It's much more formal adversarial process kind of follows what you might imagine a trial would, would, uh, would file. There's a court reporter, there's witnesses, people are sworn in. Uh, they're, they're, and, the, and they are, they're, they're questioned. Um, there is, there's no jury. The hearing officer makes the decision. It happens at the school district as opposed to a courtroom, but it generally follows the process of a, of a, uh, of a court, a traditional, more traditional kind of court proceeding. Um, you do not have to be represented by counsel at uh, a due process hearing. However, public agencies do have to be represented by counsel and they will have attorneys uh, at due process hearings. Um, and the, the, when you look at due process requests and you look at the success versus parents with counsel and parents without, it's dramatic uh, lack of success for parents that don't have counsel at due process hearings compared to those that, that do. Um, the IDA is a fee shifting for, uh, a statute, which means if you are successful or you're able to settle the case, the school district is going to pay uh, hourly attorneys, your hourly attorney's fees. So oftentimes we're able to take cases without charging families any sort of uh, hourly rate, which makes it a little bit more accessible to you. And this is the variety, I mean, all kinds of relief that you can get there from due pro pro uh, process, better school program, additional related services, tuition reimbursement to a private school, uh, compensatory education services for, for past failures, outside evaluations, um, you know, uh, uh, a determination that a behavior was a manifestation, they can't go forward with the, with the expulsion. There's a variety of, of, different, uh, of, of, uh, of different forms. So that brings us to the end of the, the PowerPoint, but I, do, I did notice there's some, some questions that came in. So we'll, we'll try to address uh, some, of those, uh, some of those questions before we end this evening. So um, we have a question, what's the difference on comprehensive reading evaluation conducted by reading specialist versus a school psychologist. So I would say that a reading specialist can complete um, reading assessments um, uh, and, and tend to maybe go in more deep in terms of reading assessments, maybe do more specific reading assessments, whereas a school psychologist can also conduct reading assessments, but they would also be conducting, um, a school psychologist can conduct all other types of assessments with the exception of um, areas of related service. But um, so a school psychologist would be able to conduct all of academic achievement, um, executive functioning, memory and learning, um, social emotional, functional behavior assessment. Mike, do you have anything to add to that? I, I agree. I mean, I think a school psychologist can, can there's, I don't think there's an assessment that a reading specialist can do that a school psychologist in theory couldn't do. Um, they might not be familiar with as many reading assessments as a reading specialist, and they may not go as deep as the reading specialist would into reading. Um, but the, And, and I, I would agree that's probably the biggest difference between uh, a reading specialist doing a reading assessment and a school psychologist doing a reading assessment. My child attends, um, I think PP, 
PPS, Pittsburgh Public School. She is on an IEP, and I was told no uh, child is to get extra help while taking Keystone's PSSA tests. What do you recommend to tell her school? Um, so that is incorrect that um, right. the special education students that need accommodations on Keystones and PSSA tests are entitled to those accommodations. Again, it, it's limited in terms of those accommodations, but, um, you know, they may be telling, if they're telling you no questions cannot be read to you on a reading uh, on the language arts assessment, but to say that no child can get um, any accommodation at all. So I'm not really sure what they mean, um, you know, if they're, by extra help. So um, next question, would a child with ADHD and asthma qualify for an IEP? My daughter's school has told me asthma is not considered a disability. So well, let me tackle ADHD first. Um, ADHD could be um, addressed through a 504 plan or may need um, special design instruction. So I would say that if a student has very mild, and I think it would need to be very, very mild ADHD, where it's um, uh, they just need accommodations um, and it's not, they don't require what we mean by special design instruction. So direct instruction in areas of executive functioning. If they don't require those the direct instruction um, to make meaningful educational progress, then a 504 would be okay. But I would say in most cases, you're probably going to need an IEP for ADHD. Asthma, um, would be um, something that would not require specially designed instruction, I would say for the most part. And Mike, I'm not sure if you can think of a situation where you might need specially designed instruction uh, for a student with asthma. But to me, that might be something where a 504 plan would make more sense. Um, accommodations um, for- uh, In most know, cases, for, I think that's-, you know, that's Sorry, that's, good. No, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, I think in most cases that's true. Um, I mean, could could asthma potentially fall under OHI, other health impairment? Possibly, but I, I, I it would really have to be re kind of wreaking havoc, I think, on a, on a student to rise to the level where there might be because of the asthma there's some sort of specially designed instruction that they would need. I, I can't think of a situation that I've had where it rose to that, that level. I don't know that I would say it never could. Um, uh, but I, I, I think ADHD is more likely to rise to the level where it would be an IEP instead of a, a 504 and asthma would more likely be 504 as opposed to, to a, uh, to an IEP. And just a couple more. What are your experiences and knowledge with the interpreting service requirements to work with deaf students? Should they be looking at language fit with the interpreter and student skills to meet the student's need to accessibility to language to prevent frustrations? So I'm, ass I'm assuming they're talking about an American, American Sign Language uh, or uh, or whatever the so for students that are that are deaf or hard of hearing, their pre pre preferred uh, mode of communication, their preferred language is their language. Um, and if it's you know if it's if it's ASL as a, as an example, American Sign Language, then the, the you know they one they need to be taught American Sign sign language if if they can be and or in, in you know uh, it, to the end to the extent that they would need an interpreter or somebody instructing them they need to be qualified to to do that in that particular in that particular language if it's if it's more about parents who are uh who, who may be deaf or hard of hearing and their ability to participate in the iep meeting the same thing would be the same it would be essentially the the same requirement that an interpreter would be necessary based, you know, that's that's qualified to translate it for whatever their 
their preferred language is. And if it's ASL, it's ASL. I know there's different forms of of sign language, so it might not be a you know traditional ASL sign language, or it might be something else. So whatever that is, it's no different than you know I you know I'm a parent and I speak you know I, I speak Spanish and I don't speak English and I need an interpreter to be able to participate in the IEP meeting in my native language, and you know they put somebody who really doesn't know you know they know. They know French, but they don't really know Spanish all that well, right? They can't they can't stick the the French interpreter, certified French interpreter who just kind of sort of knows Spanish, right? They they've got to they've got to put the um, the the the, uh, the the right person in to to do the job, and I think I would view it the same way. And then um, this is more of a a comment, I think, but some school districts tend to say no more often to mediations for whatever reason, parents sometimes have no choice but to pursue due process. I think when you were talking, Mike, about due process, um, and and I think that um, uh, that it, it's very true that parents that are represented have a um, better chance of success when um, pursuing due process. And it's a shame that uh, school districts um, that you're seeing school districts are saying no to mediation. Um, it's a shame for their sake. Great. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, so I, is that, did we get all the, 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 uh, the questions, Heather? Great. Well, yes. thank you everyone uh, for, uh, for joining us uh, tonight. I hope you found um, this uh, tonight's presentation uh, useful and helpful to you. Um, and if we can, uh, if we can be of uh, any assistance to you, we're only a, a phone call or uh, or an, uh, an email away. So thank you all. Have a uh, have a wonderful uh, wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you.